Is that audio working? Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to day two. Hope you enjoyed yesterday. I know it was a long day, but uh, certainly was uh, full of interesting topics and uh, an enjoyable day. And uh, yeah, we were delighted to finish the evening with some nice drinks and, and of course the fellows and the Richard Petrie Award. I think we're about to start the session, um, the panel discussion today. Um, and But before we get into the topic of that, I just wanted to invite Sergio, who's going to be co-moderating with me today. And this is actually kicking off the national conference. So. Yeah, exactly. I think that. Um... Yep. I think that yesterday we told that it's um, it's a national conference, but it's not in Spanish. So really, it's a national conference because we are trying to uh, get some uh, best practices from Spanish companies in order to share, but are other from not Spanish companies. So really, it's open for uh, all the attendees to the to the whole summit. Great. Yeah, and so. Uh, lots of other sessions happening on so we've got a lot of different sessions today so feel free again for everyone attending to um, be part of the sessions that are open and available throughout the event but with that I think I'd like to kick off this session um, this is a session titled interoperability in action we have four great speakers here today um, we've structured this uh, a little differently we've asked each presenter to come up and and deliver a sort of TED talk five minute presentation we will then invite them to the stage and then we're going to start a uh, panel discussion. But the other thing that we'd like to ask for the audience participation today is we're going to ask for your questions and we've got a roving mic. So at, at the point where we start the panel, please start thinking of questions that are challenging hard and are going to push them out of their comfort zone because that's why they're here, right? So this is what it's all about. So yeah, um, we'll start that. Today's session uh, is titled Interoperability in Action. In today's interconnected world, achieving seamless on interoperability across diverse software platforms and systems is critical. This panel brings together industry experts to discuss practical strategies, challenges, and success stories related to interoperability and open standards. From design and planning to construction and maintenance, we'll explore how these things span all phases of the life cycle. And with that, I'd first like to welcome Francois Valois, who is the VP of Civil Engineering for Bentley Systems. Please, Francois. Thank you, Aidan. Is the mic working? Thank you, Aidan. Uh, nice to meet you, everybody. Good morning. If you're not awake now, you are, hopefully. Thanks for being here. Buenos dias. Um, I'm trying to learn Spanish, but I won't do this speech in Spanish. Uh, so thank you. So our uh, customer, as well as yours, as well as yourself, are relying every day on interoperability. So the... Is this working? Ah. So for... Practical uh, purposes, people use different tools from different vendors all the time, right? So they need interoperability. So it's clearly the cornerstone of digital delivery today for pretty much anybody around the planet doing infrastructure engineering. There's multiple benefits of uh, doing interoperability. So the benefits have to do with, oops, there you go, sorry, technology challenges. Some benefits have to do with uh, data exchange and uh, uh, enabling reuse across the different uh, tools, uh, enhancing the quality of work. So if we're able to gather all that data into a centralized system, checking the standards, checking the quality of the data, we're able to really uh, create better durable walls as well. It's going to also en enhance and foster innovations across the board and allow collaboration and optimization of the different workflows in there. So we must be able to break the data silos across the board. We must be able to say, uh, okay, Bentley work with Esri, work with Autodesk and so on, and we must not create new data silos. This is why standards like IFC and also open platforms like iTwin are essential, essential in advancing the world of infrastructure. Some very successful projects and early adopters as well as uh, leading organization have been using this sort of technology. For example, WSP here on a rail project in Sweden, I've been using iTwin to assemble data from various sources, whether that is DTN data, DWG, Revit, IFC, shapefiles, and make that all together to be able to disseminate the information, to check the quality, uh, to make sure that this data is delivered in a consistent way. Every day they were reporting uh, progress, calculating quantities, 
and do that in a very consistent way, saving them uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars onto, onto that project. We then must be able to use that interoperability for sustainability and also for optimization of the workflow and productivity. So if we're able to early on check all the problems in design before it goes to construction and in construction before it goes into operation by having that complete data interoperability, we're able to save a lot of time downstream and really elevating the playing field, making that data reusable across different phases, right? Too many times we go into a 2D phase uh, we take these beautiful 3D models that are created, we create these drawings, and the data is really lost. So how do we uh, make sure that, the data, that this data is used across? Also, we need to be able to use that data for sustainability uh, purposes, right? Uh, making sure that the environment is being considered in this. So things like uh, LCA check, carb and body carbon calculation should be able to be used on that sort of data. One leading organization in the Western United States has done this on a large bridge project, and they essentially were able to use iTwin again to assemble data from various sources, so from Rhino, from Revit, from other, and including IFC, and then doing the design review, the collaboration, and the data sharing, and finally using our one-click LCA integration and EC3 to essentially calculate the embodied footprint uh, of carbon for that one project. So it's really key, right? This data interoperability is allowed to bring all this data together and be able to make this sort of analysis. So really cornerstone of the world in there. So what's coming along the way? I mean, we just essentially started, right? Even though uh, Building Smart has been around for a long time, in the infrastructure sector, it's still an essence thing, right? We can see in the United States and Canada that you know all of the owners, all the ECs, and everybody starting to collaborate to really advance this. Uh, in the infrastructure world, whether it's in the road, the bridge, so the main and so on. So there's gonna be more work. There's more work for all of us, more work for all of us to get together, more work for all of us to enhance and improve the depth of our interoperability uh, across with each other and across the, the different life cycles and different phases. So it's a very bright future uh, because not only does it enable all that collaboration, but also interoperability would, will enable things like AI to be used on that data making sure that this, all this information is uh, structured in a way that is gonna be useful for machine to be using downstream and making all these tools and the whole workflow more effective and more efficient downstream. So thank you very much, Aiden. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Francois. And I, I, I like the comment you made there about the future trends. And I, I know in, when we talk about infrastructure, but if we consider building smarts heritage and history, which really came through the buildings of the sort of vertical construction, if we think about the opportunity into infrastructure, it's huge, it's huge right? So we're really developing things like IFC 4.3 with the extensions into infrastructure. But then if you think about IFC 5 and how that, that can be developed to support power networks for water industry for you know even roads and rail it's it's a huge opportunity ahead i think so yeah i agree most definitely you're right great thank you very much so next presentation is from aka software and i think uh michelangelo chian truly almost needs no introduction because he has the coolest uh, job title which is open bim expert so michelangelo you have to stand by this sign at some point and get a picture of yourself with your your job title there so please michelangelo Thank you, thank you, Aidan, and uh, uh, hello, everyone. Um, today, I would uh, like to tell you a story about uh, microscopes and uh, telescopes. Uh, but first, let me introduce to you Aka Software, uh, which is an Italian software company for the ASC uh, industry. Uh, Aka has a long uh, history, as it was uh, founded about 35 uh, years ago and uh, quickly became an uh, Italian market leader. Fast forward about uh, 30 years, in uh, 2018, uh, ACA joins Building Smart International with a clear mission to transform BIM in Open BIM. In uh, about five years, the contributions to the uh, BSI community are uh, countless. Uh, two victories at the Building Smart Awards, two finals, one special mention, but also uh, 20 software certified uh, for uh, IFC import and export, uh, making it the company 
uh, with uh, more software uh, certified uh, than uh, anyone, anyone else. And uh, of course, a lot of uh, contributions uh, in the uh, BSI uh, working projects, uh, such as the IFC Rail, uh, IFC uh, Infra, uh, and, uh, and so on. So now let's go back to our story about uh, microscopes and uh, telescopes. The microscope and the telescope are two tools that allow us to explore the universe in a completely different way. There is the microscope, uh, which we need to see things that uh, we cannot see otherwise because they are invisible to the naked eyes. So with uh, them, we can see bloods and uh, cells, for example, but also uh, the relationships that they have, the systems that they create, and how uh, they are connected to each other. On the other side, we have the telescopes. The telescopes are big and they have this uh, huge and uh, powerful lens that uh, allow us to uh, look forward, look at the distant stars and at different uh, galaxies. So uh, we need them. We need them because they allow us to dream about uh, the possibilities. So, we can say that these tools are complementary to each other because they basically allow us to see the universe uh, from different point of view and from different scales, uh, from the uh, smallest uh, and infinitesimal world of the uh, microscopes uh, to the infinite of the uh, galaxies uh, that we can reach with the uh, telescopes. So do you see uh, who we are talking about here? Well, I will tell you, it is BIM and GIS. We can imagine uh, BIM and GIS as the microscope and the telescope of the built environment. The GIS offer us a panoramic view of the world on a territorial and global scale, while with BIM, of course, we can go into the details of each of the assets, down to the single invisible board. And as I said before, these are complementary view and we need both of them because we need to see the world at different scale. And the thing is, th is that we have to combine them. We have, use, uh, we have to use them together because by combining them, we start to see the world, the universe uh, with different eyes and we start to see uh, things that were not visible before. And by combining them, uh, we can use uh, the uh, benefits of uh, uh, each of, the, of these uh, technologies uh, to create cities that are uh, smarter, more intelligent, and of course, in the end, more sustainable. So we definitely need uh, to combine them. And this is our vision of interoperability. It is not easy, it requires a lot of work and uh, there are many challenges, some of which we will uh, talk and discuss about uh, later in this panel uh, as well. But all of that is possible thanks to the common ground established by the use of the OpenBeam uh, IFC format, which allows to connect and uh, establish uh, common views of the world from such uh, different uh, scales. All of that otherwise would not be uh, possible. And uh, the GeoDigital Twin is exactly this idea realized in practice, which is what we are working on at HACA. This allows us to uh, open up to new possibilities because then everyone can interact in such open environment. And of course, it's not only about BIM and GIS, because if we apply uh, the same reasoning, then we can in fact then integrate uh, other systems as well. Uh, think about the asset management, asset operation, facility management, IoT systems, and so on. And this open up new possibilities because then everyone, as I said, can interact in such open environment, even with the functionalities that at the moment we cannot even think about. And again, 
I cannot uh, uh, stress out more the fact that all of this is possible because we have this common ground that is established by the use uh, of open formats. So I hope to have told you a brief but it, interesting story. The story which tells you the vision about uh, interoperability uh, at Taka Software. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michelangelo. And interesting. So if I ask you to look through your telescope, do you think we will be in the future talking about BIM and GIS or does it just become we we'll talk about digital twins or geo-digital twins? How, how do you think the future will look once we do solve this interoperability challenge? I think and I hope that at some point in time they will kind of merge up and so we will talk about geo-digital twin to mean uh, both of, uh, of them. Uh, at the moment, uh, it is okay to have them uh, in such a disconnected uh, words uh, because uh, at the moment, uh, each one is uh, developing its own, uh, let's say, functionalities. But it's when we will combine them that we will see uh, some of the benefits that will also allow uh, us to call them geodigital twin, which will mean the combination of, uh, of both. Francois, do you do you agree with that? Do you think that the future will look like digital twins and it becomes obvious that BIM and BIM data and GIS information, layers of information become just part of the digital twin? So you want to start a debate right now? <laughs> no. like I'll just um, a comment on that. I, I agree with part of this. I think there there is going to be always a world where, um, you know, the world would be looked at Microsoft and telescopes. And I think I like I love your analogy. I think this is spot on into this and a more federation of systems is what I would see federations of different uh, data source coming together to rip some of the benefits of what you talk about. Uh, I think ultimately what you talk about maybe in a sort of 15, 20 years horizon probably is possible with a sort of single digital twin view with different lens is what we're aspiring to get at. Uh, and, and, and there's still a lot of work to do, right? We, as human beings, we haven't even agreed on electricity uh, plugs and uh, side of the roads to drive on. So for us to agree on all those things, it will take a while. So I think federation of systems is gonna be what, uh, what it what it is and digital twin uh, talking to other digital twin and being able by AI and so on is something that is uh, a pretty realistic future in that context. So federation of systems. Yeah. Very good. And, and I like the, the idea of a lens. And if we talk about lenses, let's get a lens from construction, the view from construction. So I'd like to welcome up Ricardo Munguia from uh, Ferrovial Constructions, who's head of uh, uh, data construction at Ferrovial. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I am the only presentation that is not about vendor software. I am a construction company. <laughs> so very happy of being with you. OK. Um, for me, BIM and GIS will be still BIM, better information management because at the end, it's, that's what for us is been. Okay, uh, we all know about this. Uh, yesterday from Bentley, somebody talked about that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is still alive. I mean, we still have problems between design, between construction, in every part of the, of the, of, of the problem. But implementing BIM doesn't solve it by itself. We can do traditional BIM helps in the process of design, BIM helps in the process of construction and in the process of operation, but, but it doesn't solve the problem by itself. We have a huge amount of impact in the design, but we don't have information from construction, so we can design better. And we don't have information from operation maintenance, so we can't build better. And also we have thousands of software. So we need really more open BIM, we need more a standard, more data dictionary, we need IDS because that's interoperability is the only way to improve our uh, sector, our industry. As I told you, uh, we must focus always as to be more efficient in carbon emissions, to be more efficient in cost, to be more efficient in time. So for, for, for to achieve that goal, we need that all the information goes from one side to another and the information fluent, flow uh, easy without uh, barriers, without problems, from one side to another. And open bin is the only, the only solution in the, in the market that we have, that we can take, as you said, from Bentley to Autodesk or from Bentley to, to Bexel or from whatever, and that you can flow information, break silos, and take a, a value from one side to another. But it's really important that there is also a, 
a free, uh, honest speech between every part. Because nowadays we are designing with one mind to do the best design that we think, which is the, the lower in time, but we are not thinking about the cost of construction. So there is a need, a real need about more data dictionaries, a standard, more information, as you said, carbon emission, but nowadays we calculate carbon emission only in the EPDs of material. We don't know the real process of construction. So there is a lack of information between every stage to the beginning, to the design, where is the real uh, power of all the work that we can do. What we have done in this way, because as we are operator of infrastructure in the US and we design, so we build, we, we do the whole process, we have done that. We have made uh, an information requirement. We have drawn our own asset dictionary aligned with IFC, and we have drawn the delivery execution plan with the leanest approach. So we only use the information required to the best efficiency for the whole project. Because many people ask to generate big models with a huge amount of parameters that only generate effort. And we have to be lean in what is needed and what really gives value for the project. And that information from operations and maintenance and that information from construction goes to the designer. And that's what I told you yesterday. With parametric design, we can improve the whole process and the whole efficiency of the, of, of the system. So more open beam and more collaboration between all of us. Thanks, Ricardo. Please have a seat. And interesting that you do the design, construction, operations, and maintenance. So it's 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 probably a good fortunate position to be in that you can sort of control some of the requirement definitions right through to how you want that to be received in in operations and maintenance. And and what sort of learning do you get from that? I suppose as a the whole life cycle view that you have. Uh, the people from design want the best for for design, and we want the best for us. And operational maintenance in the first beginning of our internal speech wanted really more than 100 uh, parameters in the BIM model. I want everything in. It's, it's important to understand each other and to have a real fluent collaboration and be honest in and transparent in what means, what kind of effort means to have all the information and what is the benefit of that information in order to to ask for the best for the whole project. Mm. We achieve that because we have a one CEO that mandates that <laughs> agreement, uh, but it was like six months of work. Yeah. And, 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 and we have everything. We need that in the, global, in the whole sector in order to have like some kind of standards uh, for the whole sector. Yeah, absolutely agree. Thank you very much. Okay, up for our final presentation, Andrew Gamblin is the AEC expert from Dalux. Please, over to you. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I was looking through the system and I was noticing some interesting trends that we've seen um, over the last, let's say, six months, I would have said. Um, number one, at the moment within our system, we have around 14,500 active projects. So these are projects that people are physically going into and using on a regular slash daily process. And interestingly, we've noticed that this is an exponential increase. This is rising consistently and is getting bigger and bigger as time goes on. And within these 14,500 projects, there are around 530,000 model files, which is a significant number. Now, some projects have two, three, four IFCs. Some projects have 5,000 IFCs, which they're utilizing on a regular basis. And like the number of active projects, this is an exponential increase that we're starting to see come through. There's around 4.3 million drawings that are being used within the system on a regular basis. Interestingly, with drawings, that's only a linear increase. But we're having around 1.4 million comments on those 4 million drawings, which is a significant number of comments that people are pushing back and forward to each other. And that, we can see, is very much an exponential increase. And of course, <clears throat> with those sorts of figures, million plus users, exponential increase. To give some scale on some of the projects that we're seeing within the system, 
on one single project, there are 1,500 plus users regularly coming in and coming out. This project alone has 172,000 documents. Now this is, could be drawings, could be specifications, could be anything that's inside of that. Around 1,500 3D models, which are being accessed, delivered, commented on, pushed back, pushed forwards. Around 37,000 tasks are being, have been created so far on the project. And 111,000 photos of what is taking place on site currently significant amount of usage and the scary thing is it's nowhere near finished there's still quite a lot more that's going through now these stats yes they're impressive they're big why am i telling you about these stats very simplistically they're only achievable through open and reliable standards so the big trend that we're starting to see is bim is starting to be adopted more and more by more and more organizations across the globe particularly within the construction space um, and building construction. But what about infrastructure? Well, with the release of IFC 4.3 that's going through there now, we're starting to see an increase of people starting to utilize the 3D models within the infra infrastructure context. I'm sure you've all seen my compatriots here on the stage. And with things like yesterday, where I believe it was the, uh, Japan who had to have the mandate now for uh, infrastructure projects to, to use IFC as well as the other things coming through, we can see that there's going to be more and more increase um, for need from infrastructure uh, projects to use IFC to create this collaboration, this interoperability. And that picture there that you can see is from the uh, Sotralink project which is in Norway, one of the largest uh, infrastructure projects in, uh, in the world currently. And that, with the introduction of IFC 4.3 and the ability to pull through alignments from there, is going to significantly increase the uptake and usage um, of IFC on infrastructure projects, which is fantastic. Now, the other thing that we're noticing as well is, obviously, Building Smart has many different chapters all around the world. Um, and having this international message, this standardized message that's coming through, but then having these individual organizations which are providing local engagement means more people are starting to utilize the standards, they're starting to provide guidance, they're starting to talk to each other, creating this amazing community that exists around the world to start putting on events like this one that happened in the Netherlands recently, where there was a practical uh, uh, contest you want to call it that, with the use of BCF. And how can you use BCF workflows across multiple different softwares to be able to uh, facilitate the coordination, particularly at the design stage? And I'm super excited to see what happens as time moves forwards with these other things like BSDD, the IDS, as more and more information uh, starts coming through, that there's going to be an even greater local engagement from the local chapters, which then eventually means that IFC is basically going to rule the world, I think. <laughs> Not far off, but thank you for listening. Thanks, Andrew. And I think it's a nice connection between yesterday's session on that we had on why IFC is important. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's more about trying to, to make sure that, uh, that the mandates help support uh, the, the growing need for interoperability, but that the software vendors uh, see the value in supporting that. And you know clearly you see the exponential growth in your system. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a demand for the amount of data being produced, but it needs to be in a standardized way to have the value for the interoperability. So yeah. you know, where do you see the biggest driver? Is it through those mandates or is it through the sort of development of services to support the standards that Building Smart can do or is it everything? <laughs> a good question. I like that. Um, I think the mandates help kick things off. Mm. Um, that's you. You need to start pushing the industry uh, to, to to understand some of the benefits that can be gained from using these standards, and then it's a slow process of people understanding, utilizing the software, understanding where the value can come, and then further development out. So the mandates, I think, are a crucial first step. And then the, the support 
um, and knowledge sharing within the community as that starts expanding, then just creates an exponential growth in the use of uh, the standards. Yeah, and this sort of hands-on, we're also seeing another trend, which is the, the, the need for hands-on learning and experience. And Ricardo, I know at your booth, you've got some, it looks like a... a, a, a Toys. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> toys. So are you, do you find that within your industry that now you need to demonstrate these things in a sort of virtual way, but also in a hands-on practical way to, to really get people familiar with some of the, the exponential growth that we see in, inside these systems? Well, the, the toy of the driving simulation is of light in the US. We are designing with Bentley, with Ben Rhodes. But the client, before approving the design, obliges us to simulate the real situation of the execution. We, are, we have generated like a digital twin internally. We take the people in the neighbor to drive, simulate the, the, the future uh, design, and they have to approve it, the neighbors. So for us, I, I, I understand it looks like a toy, but it's, it's obliged by law in the, in the US. So uh, we have to prove it because it's mandatory. And, and Michelangelo, what sort of technologies do you see that will help to do those hands-on things? So is it really seeing is believing? Is it AI? You know, what sort of technologies will help people really see the value when they start to get their hands on your tools? I mean, is it, is it fundamentals or is it, are we talking really futuristic things that will, will allow that? So is it immersive reality or what do you think is the most important factor? Well, at the moment, from uh, uh, our experience, I could say that, uh, yes, those um, futuristic view, but not so futuristic, because uh, as we uh, heard, it's uh, enforced by law, are fundamental. But also, let's say, uh, more practical things. Uh, we see uh, more and more companies um, in Italy, for example, uh, that uh, are uh, making special, specialized groups of people uh, that are learning about uh, open standards in a theoretical way, but then they want to apply what they have learned. And uh, so now um, we um, make them use the tools uh, that uh, uh, may do at the moment uh, simple things, but at least they can see in practice what they, are, uh, learn, what they have learned so far. And uh, the cool thing is that uh, uh, there are companies, big companies, uh, that are doing this more and more with more people. So they now have a, a workforce uh, that is uh, uh, at least as expert, if not more, uh, than uh, uh, the, the vendors. So they can challenge the, the vendors uh, when they uh, see uh, that uh, something is uh, uh, reachable in theory, but they not actually see that is uh, yet possible in practice. So they, they are actually starting to uh, taking uh, uh, the uh, command of uh, what they would like to, to achieve, but because they uh, are learning uh, the, the fundamentals to, to, to use the, uh, the tools. The tools are uh, just um, what uh, they are fundamental, of course, but they, it is more important that they learn what they could do uh, in, uh, in theory then the tools is a, a consequence. The tools will uh, evolve and will try to accommodate their, uh, their needs. So, of course, uh, in the future, uh, future trends, AI and things like that will uh, uh, change, maybe change uh, everything uh, again. But at the moment, we see the use of those fundamental tools that apply the different standards that we have talked about. So it's not only about IFC, but also BSTD, IDS, uh, BCF and uh, and so on. So yeah, and that evolution, I think, Francois. When I think about, you know, inside what it must feel like inside a software organization like yours, when you see things come along like photogrammetry, the ability to capture things in a rapid way that is geometrically accurate and provides you a a mesh, let's say, of of something that you know you saw how many photos were uploaded earlier in the Dalek system. The ability to capture things in the real world to then have that in an engineering model there must have been a nice moment in your career where you think that's cool technology and i want to show that off to my customers and i want them to utilize those things is that a is that a nice part of your job when you see things like that and you you, you yeah. really see the accurate <laughs> i mean i think innovations happen in sort of an interesting way right there's not a one linear path it's not only the owner uh 
you know, mandating something. It helps. And by the way, if any owners in the room, we we want more mandate because this helps everybody crystallize their you know, requirements and it makes e it easier for software vendors to implement this sort of things. But then innovation comes also bottom up from the, the software industry, from also unexpected sources, right? Uh, whether you look at the, you know, non-traditional uh, software vendors in, the, in this industry. I think this is really interesting that all of this converge. And then this whole idea of the art of the possible. So if somebody see a technology, you mentioned the whole uh, reality modeling kind of techniques, um, you know, can we apply that in the, in, in, in the domain of infrastructure? And I think what's key here, and I think one of the key role of, of, of the whole uh, building smart organization is education of the, of the people, right? Uh, we don't want to leave people behind uh, just because they see this, this magic technology. They need to be able to adopt that. And, and the software vendors and, and, and everybody, we have a role to essentially advance that, right? Everyone in this room let's not let people behind a lot of people are still working in 2d drawings i mean that's majority of people let's face that right how do you bridge that gap between where they are to where they might aspire to be and this whole notion of digital twin and this this bright future that us experts in this room are talking about um how do you bring the whole industry there and that's key and this is also sort of innovations that can happen how do you connect this 2d 3d world together and, uh, you know, make sure that people can really understand and grasp that, you know. Uh, you mentioned the number of drawing, you know, it's like this is this is everywhere, right? And people still produce a large number of drawings. So what do we do with all that data? Can that become intelligent? Can that be linked with the model? Can we start using that in our QEQC? Can we do AI on that? Can we remove the burden of this mundane task of creating drawing? Can we automate all of this through AI, right? That sort of things. This is what we're looking at. Uh, and this sort of, so to go back and what I was saying is like the mandate, the owners, seeing the art of the possible, the technology people, the the uh, the ECs, the con the contractors, are all driving together to try to to get there. So uh, yeah, try to make that living the the playing field because we we talk about data going from design to construction to operation, but only some leading firms are doing that. Not everybody, right? Not the contractor in Ohio, you know, with uh, you know. 10 people, right? So those people are definitely not part of that. How do you bring everybody along, you know? Yeah, yeah and I like this idea of the art of the possible. And I, I bring that back to, to you, Andrew, when I think about the exponential amount of information in your system. So do you, as an organization, realize that you have a lot of information that is going to potentially be very valuable to organizations? And it's about how do you structure that? How do you get the art of the possible into the hands of your customers to say, actually, have you thought about applying some techniques to improve the way you're, you're working? Does that, is that an internal conversation you have? Not that I'm part of. I'll, <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, I mean, yes, I, we are aware, obviously, as a common data environment, you're going to host a lot of information. Um, and you're going to, I think the, the art is storing the data in a way that is then accessible mm. for, later, for, for later usage. Um, you know, talking about <clears throat> open APIs, open CDE, um, there's no point having a system which is you put all your data in, you can never get out again. Mm -hmm. um, so I think drawing on some experience from, from my previous contracting days, it's very difficult to show people the out of the possible if they're still struggling with the current scenario. Um, sometimes the only way to do that is to effectively do some work in the background and then basically say, by the way, using your data, this is what you could achieve if you wanted to do this. Some will take it, some will grab it, and some will run with it. Others will look at it and go, that's nice, not right now, um, I'll look at it later. But I, I did hear a phrase that data is a new oil, and I very much think within the construction context, that is very much the case. Mm. Um, the, that data is gonna become invaluable for future projects, for sure. I mean, do people in the room, I mean, I see some familiar faces from other software vendors. Do, do we feel like this data is the new oil and that, that the art of the possible, there's a real opportunity here in the next few years to, to make good use of that? I mean, thinking about sustainability, you know, exactly. How, how do we make the impact on the industry without thinking of the art of the, the possible using data? As I told you in design, if you take all the data that you have from construction and operation and maintenance and you really transfer that to design, you can create magic. 
I mean, Magic, we, we have a 3% average of the benefit as a construction company average, and you can improve uh, the, the, or reduce the cost by 30%. That's increasing your benefit by 10 times. And that's real, we have done that. Uh, so the opportunity is huge. We are so delayed with the rest of the industries in the world that we have a huge opportunity to improve. And it's important to understand where you have the lack of information, where, where you are not collecting information or where you are collecting information only in isolated projects. And you have to need a global standard way of collecting information as a company in order to improve. And once you have that, the, the opportunities to, to improve everything is, are huge, huge. And Miklandra, do you see that the same for you, Aka? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would uh, stress out the point of uh, quality of uh, data. And I think that if uh, IFC is the common ground, then BSDD and IDS are the things, the standards that allows to raise the bar of the quality. And I think this is a uh, very important uh, because if uh, I see outside of uh, our world, I think uh, most of us uh, are hearing about uh, uh, AI uh, developments which are going so fast and so exponential uh, and we see that there is this uh, uh, run to the quality of the data. Uh, Reddit, for example, for those of you who know, uh, has always been had uh, open APIs to get the, uh, their, uh, uh, their topics, the, their uh, data, their, uh, uh, their text from their website. But when they have uh, understood that the, the quality of the data was actually quite good, they shut off, shut off the API and, and they, they are now selling the data to OpenAI or, uh, or others. Uh, and uh, everyone is doing uh, similar things or the same. Or we have seen, uh, uh, again, other um, similar things um, like uh, the Wall Street Journal, I think, was that uh, uh, sued OpenAI because they have used their uh, data which is, of course, of high like, quality to train their algorithms for AI. So I don't see why this uh, should not apply to the construction world as well. So data, but of course, quality data. The opportunities will, uh, will come uh, afterwards uh, in, uh, in many ways. Francois, do you concur with that? Yeah, and, and also you're starting to touch on the point of data confidentiality and what the vendor will do with the data. Um, so that's why we established clear data policy that basically says state that we shall, we eventually will not use your data uh, for AI uh, machine learning without your explicit consent, right? So it's really very key for us that um, it's not something hidden in our, uh, you know, legal text or somewhere so that we can just bas basically grab the, the data from our customers and do something with it that is not intended for. Um, even if, if it could benefit the rest of the industry. So we have these very strict constraints because uh, we feel that, that your data is your data and we should never do that, use it for something that it was not intended for. So that, you know, to that your example with the Wall Street Journal is spot on. Uh, this industry can learn from the rest of the world in that context. And plus, because we're working on critical infrastructure and, 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 and private uh, customers, that is not something that we can afford to do and our reputation for us is more important than than that so so we really are um we think this is key that every software vendor has these sort of policies in there um in that context and yeah mo most definitely quality of data absolutely but quality in the sense of of the the whole ifc standards is is absolutely necessary right do, do you have the the right fields and that sort of things but but also quality in this is, is this meeting the functional requirements uh, for example, uh, we have services to validate a roadway design. Okay, so you say, okay, the roadway design is done. Now you take this, you put it in a system, and then you can check if the super elevation, if you know what super elevation is, that when you drive the road, it does that. And now uh, we can check these kind of standards. Is that is the bridge uh, built in a way that is going to have enough clearance and this sort of check. So the 3D models is not only good from a, you know, data table consistency, but also... Is it something that can be constructed? Is it something that meets the functional requirements of what it was designed for? And that's really key because these 3D models, you know, validation of these 3D models is is complex. Right? Um, uh, 
um, and so you know, and this is this has been happening in the building world a little bit, and now it's expanding into the infrastructure world. Um, sort of an interesting side. I was having a conversation yesterday uh, during the cocktail, and that's why these events are great. Um, somebody said, like in the building industry, it took a long time for us to adopt because there's a lot of smaller players, you know, that come together. We're in the infrastructure. If all DOT or Trans Ministry of Transportation mandates that, it's the whole state, it's the whole country that sort of shift over. So the rate of adoption, and that's what we see uh, as well, is that is really accelerating in that context. You know, it's absolutely going to go much faster in the infrastructure because of that, because it's like it's going to be like nothing happens and suddenly whoop, a big a state shift and then everybody working in Texas is going to have to do the following things, right? And that's so, what, yes. So, yeah, it's really fast because of this, because there's less, there's bigger, larger players to that are moving. Yeah. Yeah, and I think in the U.S., a good example there, and I'm sure, Ricardo, I think you, Provial, are uh, present in that market as well, that, you know, Ashto put out this resolution that mm. data needs to be exchanged using IFC format. So this is great for us, but it does stress test the IFC, you know, the credibility that we need to make sure is there. So we need the services like validation service. We need to make sure IDS is pervasive in the industry. You heard yesterday from the ODA, they have to have toolkits to support this. There needs to be the valid, you need to know that that's a valid model. It's back to the quality of data. You can't just exchange IFC information if we don't know that the model that you're using is valid. And then you've got the challenge as the vendors to actually fix those issues. And I'm sure that's a common discussion. Do, do you see, you know, is that collection of those things important for your customers, Andrew, in terms of how valid models get into your system? And then how do you check those, you know, to make sure that they are? Is that just a case of making sure that you're on top of the building smart standards and, and, and working with those to make sure you can, you can give the best quality of data? So <clears throat> our system is very much a, uh, it, it services information you put into it. Um, so sometimes we'll have people, you know, contact us, you know, why are, I, why are our IFCs in different locations, you know, in the software they're in the right place. And it's like, ah, it turns out, you know, base points, project base points and all these sorts of things kind of come into play. Um, and even in some cases, you know, people are, you know, why does this element have this parameter against it? Because that's how it was exported. So our system is very much in, in terms of um, allowing people to interact with the data that has been put into the system. So it will show you if there is a problem with the, with the thing. Um, there is some, some small things we're starting to develop in terms of model validation and parameters. You know, has this object got the right parameter against it? So that's going to help on the design side. Um, but it's still very much a case of um, if there is a difficulty with viewing the information, we will point them towards the standards or for, towards other validation tools in terms of, you know, have they got any, uh, uh, is it pipes with uh, no diameter, you know, that kind of a thing. Mm. So, yeah, that's, uh, I think the authoring tools are starting to get better in yeah. terms of the export out of the information, which mm. then makes it easier for this stuff to, to happen. Yeah, and, and I mean, Ricardo, from your point of view, is it important? That, I mean, it's a, it's a silly question, but vendors starting to really work together in our industry i'm i'm noticing it to be honest with you that the the ability for 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 vendors to work together to support those things is that how critical is that from your point of view that you know you can go to a tool from acker and alex and bentley and actually they're starting to collaborate together for us it's critical as critical as that we have several software vendors that work really impressively well but they don't export in open format so we are not using those capabilities of those software vendors. We need, because if you export, if you do inspections in, and you export in PDF, that's not that data I can use. We are using generative AI in several use cases for health and safety, for, for procurement, for uh, prediction of prices. We are using generative AI for quality. And, and so we have already several use cases of generative AI. And if we can't use the data from the software vendor, we are not using that. And we are not going to use that. And if we can't use that in a company level, because uh, people are focusing project level, uh, we are not using that. Mm. So, and we are trying to push everybody to go on the same way and sending the same message. We need interoperability in between software. We need the. I mean, this is a, a, a global success. The most 
use I can take from one software vendor into another software, it will be benefit the both. Mm. But if you are attracted by the Apple effect that everything for me, nothing for the rest, you are going to die mm. in, in, in the sector. So it's important that you don't only read from IFC, that you export in IFC or you export data in open formats. So we can take those data to another software and to another platform and take benefit from that. Again, we are using a lot of generative AI. We were the first company in the world that implemented generative AI internally, native. And, and we have several use cases and that are proving really value. Um, so for us, it's key. <laughs> and, you know, I look at Acker Software and I think, you know, they embrace Open BIM so much, you know, just go and check their website out. That's about how to embrace Open BIM. And when you hear from the organization like for OVL that it's critical, does that just continue to support the way you approach the market from your point of view? Because you clearly support all the standards that we develop. You want to work with everybody. You know, you're working on BIM and GIS with history and things like that. So is that just confirmation that you're doing the right things at ACA? It is confirmation. And uh, um, yes, I think. Um, also, um, as I said before, um, the fact that now uh, also construction companies have uh, so much people that have learned about this thing means that uh, they now uh, are setting up the uh, requirements, which is what we have seen in the presentation. And uh, is, it is this, I think, that uh, will uh, uh, raise the uh, quality of the data. So the ideas will check that everything uh, is uh, uh, fine, but what is, it is written in the IDS, which is the real uh, value for each of the company, uh, is the work that uh, construction companies, for example, are doing to make sure that the IFC will contain the data that they needed and that really has uh, value for them. Of course, uh, there will be many IDSs uh, in the sense that uh, uh, each one will target different uh, views. So that the model will contain uh, data that is uh, ready for other systems to be integrated and to be uh, consumed. So uh, now that uh, everyone is at the same level, let's say from a theoretical point of view, uh, the vendor uh, will have to improve their tools, of course, but can uh, only get you uh, so far. Uh, I mean, they can facilitate uh, the export, let's say they can uh, give you the possibility to do all of the things that are possible in, uh, in theory, uh, but then the hard work uh, should be done by the companies, which will uh, we, we now have the, uh, the tools, the possibility uh, to mandate uh, the data that they need in the, in the models. So mm. this, I think, confirms uh, the fact that, that we, can, uh, we are providing the right tools for them to uh, really uh, be uh, the, the the companies the the, the one that are using the, those uh, tools uh, to be let's say uh, in charge of what they want in their uh, models. So yeah, it is a, a confirmation of that. Francois, do you see the same thing when you work with big clients that actually it's confirmation that this, the approach that Bentley is taking is absolutely the right path? Because you know you look at your iTwin platform and mm. actually something that Bentley did a few years ago, which was to publish all of your code onto GitHub. You know, this yeah. was like a big statement to say, we're here to work with the, in the industry and the community and, and we want people engaged and we're going to support our customers through that process. Right. Uh, so uh, so itwings.org uh, is available today as a development platform and, and, and is open for everybody and is connected with IFC and, and port export and getting all of this. So these, these standards and not to shameless plug, but like sort of saying like th those are key for realizing the digital twin long term, right? Not us, but overall this industry, uh, that's what we aspire at, at doing. And we believe that if the industry gets to a true digital twin, you know, everybody's going to benefit, not us, but every software vendor and on, on the planet, essentially, and more importantly, the customers on that. Um, and I want to thank o the ODA group because we use that technology as well. And it makes it because a lot of other software vendors are also using it, 
uh, makes it consistent across, right? Thank you. I don't know if they're in the room here, but I think Neil's up there at the back. Yeah, yeah. great, great work. <laughs> so uh, it makes it um, easier for software vendors to to do this. And if there's a problem with once, at least it's consistent across, right? So <laughs> it consistently is is working together. Um, is it makes it useful because the implementation of these standards is very uh, costly in a sense for for everybody. So that is a big time saver. But and then how do you stay at the forefront of that? How do you make sure your system are intelligent and creating intelligent data? So it goes in there. Um, it's really key there. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think it might be good to jump to the audience now. Maybe, yeah. Neil, you might have a, a comment on that. Is that your view from the ODA? But if there are other questions from the, the audience, I would like to yeah. ask you to, to put the uh, panel out of their comfort zone and uh, <laughs> give them some challenging questions. Yes, there's one at the front here. My name? Sure. Oh, sorry. There's mm. one at, sorry, at the back first. That's right. We only have one mic, so... Please ask questions in groups, that would be great. Uh, thank you. I have a question on the Delux platform. It was really nice to see that you could uh, monitor how much more there's been uploaded. But that's, of course, the first step that people share their data. Do you also see an increase in interaction with other data? Because as engineers, we normally do not easily trust other data. We like our own data. When you say interaction, in what sense? That you see that. Uh, data that's been uploaded has also been used by other parties. Yes, <clears throat> yes, we definitely see that. Um, okay. There's there's a lot of internal workflows within the system. Um, there's various plugins that we have within our own particular software for, for the authoring tools. And we're seeing a greater and greater adoption of that, which allows designers, engineers to be sitting within their own system um, and interact with the data which is on the, on the, the, uh, in the cloud, basically. Um, so we are seeing a greater, it's not just a upload, dump, walk away. It's much more of a upload, let's communicate, let's collaborate, let's work on, on how to uh, solve any potential uh, difficulties with the design. Um, so yes, we are definitely seeing that. Okay, that's great news to see that we're to the next <laughs> level. <laughs> any other questions? I've got one at the front of I know. I'll just... Neil, any comments from you from the ODA? You were, you were just talking a bit about the importance of that. I just want to hear some comments. I, I only want to clear, I am civil engineer, we trust in others' data. <laughs> 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 because I didn't understand that, <laughs> that really issue. <laughs> yeah, I, I just comment that uh, we're really seeing a change in vendors' attitudes over the past few years, uh, uh, embracing openness. I, I think Bentley's been a leader with this for a long time, and they've actually been helping us with our, our support for DGN all the way back into the early 2000s. But uh, the, the implementation for, for all of these these formats, both open and, and proprietary formats, is, is really complicated. Uh, and I believe that uh, the vendor cooperation working together at this level, it, it makes sense, it helps everybody. And we're pleased to, to see most of the industry um, becoming open and, and friendly to this idea. Yeah, thank you. Got a question here, Vino, at the front? Yeah, sure. Keep, sorry. You get your steps in today, Sergio. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> It's, it's early. <laughs> so let me make one question before. So um, you know that in many projects are used um, not only one CV solution. Many times the client use one, mm -hmm. but the pointing parties are using you know, others. No? So it's a real issue how to deliver or exchange you know, information between them. So. Uh, Probably Ricardo knows quite well. So, which is your approach about uh, to exchange all that kind of information between the different uh, CV solutions? So, yes. In my case, <laughs> we have, for example, with Adif yesterday, they have their own CD with ACC. We use our own CD with Procore. Uh, for design, we have another CD, for example, in, in, in the US with ProjectWise. We try to keep in the CD the information that we want for that specific role. And we try to interchange only the information required in order not to duplicate, triplicate, uh, to, to copy the information in every CD. Um, and with the focus of not increasing the work, because several times the people are asking to use their own CD. And that means that you have to repeat the process, the whole process, operational process, in their CD and your CD. 
So we try to interchange the information as simple and then the only needed one and, and have open connection between them. But there is a gap, there is a problem there because everybody wants, I want to do everything in my CD and you say, okay, I have my ISO certification, I have my process and ID, need my information inside. Yeah, I've seen a couple of examples now where um, the, the, the client has their own CD where they're following their own processes um, and the contractor who is using uh, Dalux, they have their own, uh, they, they would like to use that for the CDPs, their own you know, parts of the design that they're looking after. And they've implemented uh, using APIs and various uh, connections where once the data is at the published state as according to ISO 19650, that then triggers a workflow that automatically uploads that information within uh, Dalux, which then allows the rest of the sub, uh, supply chain and uh, designers to then work on that information. And if there is anything that goes back, again, there's a workflow that pushes it back up the line into those things. So it's not as seamless as it could be, I think is probably fair to say, but with the introduction of the open CDE uh, and various other requirements, it's only a matter of time until you do start getting that seamless nature between this is my CDE, it's reached that point in the workflow, it's now safe for others to work from, and it will start getting much better integration. My name is Veno Tarande. Thank you for interesting discussion. <laughs> Uh, I have been working with um, lifecycle management platforms for the whole built environment for more than 10 years as professor at KTH and now my own consultant. And I have a question about versioning. I'm still very worried about that. When we take the design version of something and then we have a new version and we objectify the different phases. So we objectify the requirements, we objectify the the design structure, and then we have the as realized, as built link to that. And uh, how do you see on this, the, the issues about the versioning and keeping these different clear phases over the whole life cycle for digital twins, for example, as we want to build that for the country? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, there is there is a real problem with the versions. Yeah, sure. I think everything will end in the cloud, where there won't be any version finally because the amount of information we are collecting is increasing every year and, and will end by being huge. Uh, point cloud of, of, of with mobile mapping of Ohio is like 30 gigas, and that's one. Uh, and and at at the moment we are focusing AFC, which doesn't have any version, so you are more, more or less stable. But in the future, I think all the proprietary software will be natively only in the cloud with software running as a SaaS in the cloud. And I mean, versioning into engineering projects is very key, right? From the from the design to the construction to the operations and and uh, it's, it's built in in many of the CDEs out there as to different versioning systems. How do you compare versions? How do you address this sort of challenges? I think that's a, you know, improving and, and getting better and better in that context. And this notion of openness, right? How do you make sure that the, the data, the CD you pick is open enough so you can access all the data uh, from the, all of these different revision, if that's what you meant by version. Uh, and then uh, to this evergreen digital twin, right? This this final sort of as built, as constructed, can we can we keep there and that's then reused in the uh and the first phase of design again right that would be the the holy grail that you i think you're referring to um yeah it's a it's a big challenge for sure and uh, yeah maybe i can um, uh, also add the fact that because we were talking about uh, open cd uh the first step was to establish how it was possible to exchange uh entire file from one CD to the other in a standard and open way. Uh, but the next step that are uh, already on the roadmap uh, are to uh, get access to uh, the models at the entity level. So uh, in, the case, uh, in this case, you can combine uh, these uh, APIs with the concept of uh, versioning, which I think then uh, will allow uh, to uh, possibly solve some of the challenges that are still uh, uh, today uh, with the versioning uh, thing. Uh, at least you, you will have the possibility to access 
data in a granular way and in the different uh, versions. Then it will be up to the uh, tools, the platforms in the cloud and, uh, and so on, uh, to do uh, something about the data, uh, to make the versioning um, less problematic, let's say. The question? Uh, hello, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask maybe, because we, I see from a um, global BIM adoption perspective, let's say, uh, this, many of these conversations, of course, here we are talking mostly about the, the, the software or the tools that, uh, and what the technology uh, provides and will provide. And of course, without that, uh, uh, it, it would be very difficult, but um, uh, what do you think that it, it's the role from uh, the technology, so therefore the software vendors or the ones that are even pioneering uh, um, its uh, adoption, um, considering that there is another side, which is the processes, so therefore the people uh, <laughs> Um, using all these, because otherwise, uh, if I um, uh, think that I am the one providing software, those tools, I think that there is even too much responsibility, uh, you know, <laughs> that you have to solve everything, uh, you know, just because the technology will solve it. Uh, once we know that even with this high uh, speed, especially after the infrastructure uh, muscles uh, came here to make it even faster, uh, which is this probably the same speed it's people, you know? So I think that it's a bit unbalanced. Uh, and how do you think that, especially the ones that are providing those tools can help in that regard? I don't know if it's a question, but... Uh, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, people, process, and technology is needed for every changes, right? And it goes back to what I said a bit earlier, make sure we don't leave anyone behind in this process so that this contractor in Iowa or anywhere else can also benefit from that and be uh, using it. But, but you're correct. I mean, the software vendors have a huge role to play in this uh, because what's the point of having a technology if nobody's using it, right? And so you need to work on the education side of things. You need to, uh, with, with schools, university, uh, technical schools, um, you know, information as well, thought leadership, all the things that I think many software vendors are inv investing into because it's, it's necessary. I remember presenting in, at the Florida user group uh, for the Bentley Florida user group, which is essentially, uh, you know, DOT uh, in the region. Uh, and I'm asking, you know, show by N, does anyone know IFC? And there was one person, right? And I'm sure I go back this year, it'll be, you know, half of the room and that sort of things. And so we talk about this, what is it, what is it useful for and this sort of things in multiple contexts, right? Uh, and I think that's useful. And then it raises the art of the possible, what's, what is possible, and then start mandating that. Uh, today, Florida DOT is one of the leader in digital delivery in the world, you know, so... Very, uh, very interesting to see all of these uh, evolving really rapidly. But you're correct. You know, you, you, without the people and the processes, technology is, is, is not useful. Mm. Okay, we've got a couple yeah, of questions. Sorry, please. Just one thing. Uh, traditionally, we, everything was done manually, isolated, with, the, with this change of technology and, and digitalization. We will have to change processes to the, to the software. Uh, we all want the software to adapt to the to our processes. That's not going to happen. So we will standardize how we do things because we will all adapt our processes to the software vendor. What we need to make it easy, to make it mobile, to make it interoperability between software. But we are going to change our processes. But it is something that uh, we are seeing uh, when I was talking before about uh, companies in Italy that are um, making their workforce to learn about uh, these things. It's not just about the theory of Open Beam, and it's not like that they jump straight to the use of uh, tools, like if the tools so will solve their uh, business needs. It, it's actually that they learn the theory, and of course they need to get to the tools, and they need to get their uh, hands dirty to understand how they work, but then they get back to their processes to uh, establish uh, probably new one, uh, to create new uh, roles and to adapt their uh, business needs uh, to these new um, 
technology to see how it uh, fits, uh, but also how to make the better out, uh, out of it. So that when they use the, the tool, they are not just users that uh, simply uh, export, let's say, the, uh, the models, but uh, they ac actually are sure that those models are fit for their purpose, which I think is what they have seen in the previous presentation where uh, the requirements were clearly listed. When the um, a construction company is then able to use tools to make those requirements that we have seen uh, in theory, also actually in the model with the use of tools, which should be uh, standardized and of high quality, of course, then the real benefits for them will start to um, to be uh, there because they will uh, actually uh, solve their business uh, needs. So, but it, it is definitely something that we are uh, seeing, at least uh, with some of the companies that we, we, with the customers that we collaborate with. So. And if I can, mm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think simplicity is the key um, for, you know, in terms of simplicity of use um, for the end user and the person who's, who's dealing with the software on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if they're able to, to interact, particularly when under stress, I mean, everyone, if you've worked on site design office, there's elements of stress and, and you will always revert back to what you know. And if you've done a paper process for 20 years, you will want the software to go back to where that is uh, or, or to, to follow your old paper process. So in those positions, you can do this. So change management is the, is the biggest element to this. Um, and I think from a software vendor's perspective, we need to uh, empower the people who are using, who, who want to use the system to understand how to make it work for them. And if that means changing the processes to, to you know, remove a step or add a step in or, or change something around, so be it. Um, and in some cases, actually entirely remove a process uh, from what's been done before because it's automatically handled within the software. So there's a giving people the tools to, uh, to, to, the tools and the confidence to be able to work with the software is, I think, one of the responsibilities from the software vendor side of things. Thank you. Michel Born, I'm representing a local standard standardization body. Um, well, thank you also for the question before. Uh, very interesting. So it's also, I, I think we are very attracted always by technology. We love these 3D models, these huge models with all the colors. And uh, we also love to talk about the future, big data, AI, and so on and so forth. We seldom talk about processes, about users, about business requirements. And that, I have two concrete questions uh, to the audience. And by the way, also this audience, we have four people, three are software representatives, one is a user, by the way. So as a local standardization representative, how serious are you as software vendors to support really actual versions of standards like IFC, like IDS, BSDD? And how open are you to run through a certification to build trust also in the market? So that's the first question. Second question, how open are you to motivate your, your local sales organizations to work together with the local standardization bodies working on local business requirements and implement, implementing them and supporting them, implementing them local, so that they also can build up trust and make your uh, commitment to the process and the business requirements? Uh, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. So, um, <laughs> yeah, most definitely open to... Uh, most definitely open for you know implementing more and more standards, uh, leveraging ODE as an example in there, and and how do we can we advance rapidly in those and stay at the forefront because it's demanded by the clients, right? Uh, whether that's in the United States or other uh, geographies, um, and then to engage in different chapters, uh, you know, absolutely, right, supporting all these different chapters around the world and make sure that we work with the right right body in in a in an area where. We have enough business and so on uh, makes sense right for us to do that 
um, we have multiple people, even even in this room, that are involved in into the Spanish chapter, into the uh, Singaporean chapter, into the German chapters, into you know different chapters, and so U.S. chapters, and so on. So, uh, so a lot of people involved from the different geographies. Uh, and then implementation is 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 when we have to sort of like okay balance it against all the other requirements. But yeah, most definitely. Uh, so yes, yes, and yes to your three questions. Uh, and uh, we're we're not trying to uh, you know be we're trying to be extremely open. It's always been part of our strategy to be open and and interoperable with with everybody else. But it's it's difficult, right? Of course, it's an it's an investment, right? If you look at, uh, for example, Apple, they made their success in being closed, right? For a long, long time, they were closed, and then they they started to open. So do you stay open and still innovate? Uh, which becomes the sort of this these these sort of balancing act uh, that. Uh, that oh, every software vendor has to face, you know, for sure. Mm. Thank you. Um, so I work for Westinghouse, and we're in the process right now of migrating uh, the design of our AP1000 nuclear power plant from a legacy plant design platform to a newer platform that supports IFC. So we're supporting, we're implementing IFC as as a quality record. So it's a, it's a huge effort. We're committed. Um, so the problem we have, though, is IFC um, works well if I want to import it into a tool to view it. But from what the designers say is if I take an IFC file, I import it into the tool. It doesn't convert it properly into the native objects. So I cannot take an IFC, bring it in, and then start making design modifications. I first need to take that and break it down into native objects. So that's a problem for interoperability. So for the software vendors, what are your thoughts on this? And are there any, um, you know, do you guys have any any ideas on what it, you want to make the conversion from IC into native objects, you know, rather support it? Um, I don't think I can speak to to your specific use case because I'm more in the civil side of things. But but I think in with the advancement of things like IFC 4.3, where it, it becomes, um, you know, better defined intelligent objects becomes easier for software vendors to to integrate right instead of being a blob of triangles and 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 geometries it's something that okay describes a road alignment for example as like you mentioned and so that makes it easier for everybody to collaborate on that so most definitely and when when the export of the isc was done by hopefully some other software right it is done in an intelligent way as well so those objects and construct uh, and that's the challenge here if you say i'm you know i'm supporting ifc 4.3 you know you have to really open the box and understand what people have implemented to know exactly what sort of level is really there and do they support smart objects or not and the sort of things so it's really there's a lot of uh, education and information that has to happen and clear documentation so uh, I think right now it's a bit it's a bit difficult for 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 somebody like an owner like yourself where you're trying to you know play on on both sides and and um, I see a good base of exchange format but it it's rarely used in a design to design kind of environment that's that's the difficult part because the design software whether it's Autodesk or or, or us or anyone else uh, have a lot of uh, business logics on their side and this may not traverse into the IFC. So you have to really sort of like um, look at it, whether that's the, I think as a, as a deliverable, as a way to give the work to somebody or, or to receive it, it's a good thing. Uh, but as, as a design to design, I think it might, it might have a uh, more improvement needed on that front. Yeah. Yes. And, and I will add that uh, this is a question that uh, somehow uh, always uh, comes up at least once in the different uh, summits. Uh, and uh, uh, the point is that it's not like that uh, IFC cannot do this, but it is actually not designed to do this. So this design to design is something that uh, uh, someone always uh, needs uh, and in theory is uh, possible, uh, but then uh, the IFC should be designed in a slightly, slightly different way. Um, as we said so far, uh, of course, there are improvements over versions. So with the 4.3, you may expect uh, better uh, results uh, because of the more available uh, objects. And uh, things will improve even further with the, the IFC uh, 5, probably. Uh, but still, uh, keep in mind that um, at the core, IFC was not designed for this 
design to design exchange, even if there are uh, many uh, try uh, uh, in, in time with the uh, design transfer view and so on. Uh, to um, uh, over time, the different software vendor have improved their ability to recognize the uh, objects and to make them native. At least I can speak about uh, the archi architectural uh, models with the structural ones a bit less, with the MEP models even worse. Uh, not sure about uh, uh, the other aspects of infrastructure, uh, how is the, the situation, but I think also that there are many working groups uh, where uh, which are defining the new standard and the new extension of the standard where you can uh, speak loud and bring your uh, use case uh, to, to attention. So definitely this needs something to be um, reviewed in the IFC itself, mm. but in theory is possible. Yeah, and Sergio, there was one more question, but we've got two minutes. So if we could just, sorry, and then there's one more question at the back and then I think we're probably at time. Okay, quick one. How aware are you that an IFC without an IDS is not of a lot of value and that an IDS is a local business standard? And you have really to collaborate with local standardization body to develop these kind of ideas. Is this something you are aware of? It's something that we are seeing. I know in, in uh, the Netherlands, <clears throat> there's quite a lot of work that's taking place around IDS um, and development of tools to help uh, the, the, the local construction market create these IDS, these standardized IDS coming through. And we're expecting to see this happen more and more as time goes on, as the IDS uh, starts getting uh, pulled across. So yes, uh, I think is the answer to that. We are aware um, and we're expecting that as long as it follows the standard, um, that it should be something that, that can be uh, utilized and, and worked with uh, within the software side of things. I would also add that, yes, we are aware, and I will also try to give you a different point of view, which is the use of IDS um, to enable connection to other systems, to maybe to legacy systems or to external systems as well, uh, because uh, more often than not, they need information provided in a certain way, which is something that you can uh, specify in an IDS, of course, with uh, local uh, regulations and so on. But maybe this will give you also a different point of view on the usage of uh, ideas. So definitely it's uh, fundamental. Otherwise the IFC without uh, ideas is as a very low quality, let's say. Mm. Sorry, then one final question, I think then, and then we'll, we'll wrap. Thank you. Uh, for me, interoperability and then reusability are quite closely related. Um, you mentioned on the Dalax platform 111,000 images, and Ferrovia mentioned um, a, a pushback on PDFs in, in their work. Um, there is a lot of legacy information in older projects, and we continue to generate a lot of images of construction projects. I wondered if the vendors had any thoughts about how we take that kind of information into our projects and make it more data-driven. There are ways to recognize what is in images. I can find photos of my dog with Google Photos. Um, I wondered if you had thoughts on how we can take in things like photos and, uh, and PDFs into the data environment as well. Yeah, I think, I think the use of AI is an obvious answer to this, right? How do you go in uh, understand what's in what's in the data. What are the requirements? Can I use that to drive my design? Can I instruct me for, you know, for example, if I want to place a building on a site, what are the you know the different margins that I have to place that? If it's in a non-structured data, they can it be understood by large natural language, uh, and then uh, and then uh, you know then convert in something that that the machine can can use. Most definitely uh, necessary to do that. And AI is an obvious answer to that, right? Uh, I think that's that's the that's the way forward. Is how do you, you know, grab all of that information in the, in these you know obscure format, dark format, bring it to something like uh, like Open BIM that makes it then visible to the rest, you know. And to to go back to your comment from to, from from Westinghouse, I mean, I think I think IFC and Open BIM is still the best thing that humanity has invented to get data across different systems. So despite all of the 
you know, you know, challenges that we're having and so on. I mean, you know, we need to continue to push forward on those things to really bring that notion of digital to it and, and, and so on forward and all that. Um, so it's still the best thing despite all of the challenges that we're having because, and that's why it's improving from version to version, you know. Yeah. For the last question, if you go to our booth, you can see several examples that we are using AI with Perfect. images for progress monitoring and for health and safety. Great. Yeah, maybe I, I can give you also another use case, uh, not about the usage of uh, AI and such advanced systems, but something that we have done recently. You may have heard in the presentations about IFC 4.3 and the alignment. So let's say the track of uh, in your infrastructure, let's say, a railway, and then we had this uh, data, and then the cloud point, which is uh, federated uh, with the IFC 4.3 model, so you can navigate it, but we also have a lot of photos, 360 degrees photos that you uh, that uh, they took when they scanned for, for the cloud point, and so yes, you can put all the photos on the, um, uh, on the cloud in these systems and have it then stored, uh, but also you can start making use of it. So for example, we have now this functionality that allows you to work along the alignment and uh, have side by side the uh, cloud point with the IFC model and those photos which are geolocalized. So they are not just uh, photos that are there, but you can start to use them. So you will uh, maybe go along the track and see the photos. Maybe you uh, will update them uh, one year uh, in, in time or because you are constructing you will do more frequently you will update the photos and you will always have the up-to-date uh, status so the data it's always the same uh, it's different way to consume it so uh, maybe these systems allows also you to think uh, a little bit uh, out of the box like uh, in this case for example and i think in terms of your your question as long as the data for these older projects is stored in a structured uh, way and you're able to access that data when you need it, I think that's going to be the key element for these older projects. Because of those 111,000 photos on that one project, for example, I'm sure a lot of them are either repetitive uh, photos that are taken of you know, maybe a, a small blemish uh, on some skirting board, for example, where the value of interrogating that data may be relatively limited. Whereas there might be, say, 20% of those photos show something significant which could help future projects. And it's being able to find those 20% within that set of data you have on the old projects, that's going to be the key bit. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I've got a big sign saying time out, and I'm sure many of you need coffee. I'd like to thank Andrew, Ricardo, Michelangelo, and Francois for a really interesting discussion. And thank you for your short presentations as well. So give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the audience as well for your participation. Please do go and check out some of the things at the, the booths that they've got there and interact with them and, and please also enjoy some coffee. So thank you very much. Thank you.